Hey everyone, this is Aaron from AaronsAudioCorner.com and today I'm going to review the Bose 901 Series 5 speaker. As you can see, this speaker does look kind of old. Bose made the 901 from I believe the 50s or the 60s up until recently when they discontinued it in about 2016. There were six series of it um, and from what I understand the series kind of came in, in pairs. So series one and series two are very similar, three and four were very similar, and five and six were very similar. This is series five, and from my understanding also, it only differs from series six in the uh, cosmetics. So the series six box, the EQ box is a different color, I think it's black, and then the speaker itself is black, and it also doesn't have this, I believe this is probably aluminum side trim panel. But functionally, it is the same from what I'm told. Now. Looking at the speaker, what we have is a whole bunch of grill cloth. Behind this grill cloth on the front is a single 4.5 inch full range speaker. And if you spin it around to the back, you can see you've got a few ports. And behind the grill cloth back here are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the same four and a half inch full range speaker. The idea is that the speaker will present about 10% direct sound versus 90% reflected sound and the goal with that is to give you the feeling of being engrossed or immersed in sound. The box, the box, the speaker also comes with an EQ box and this is to basically help out the low end and the treble of them using the four and a half inch full ring speaker up front. So this four and a half inch speaker up front that you cannot see right now behind the grill cloth is limited in bass and also limited in treble. I actually measured the speaker raw, and by raw what I mean is I measured this speaker um, with no EQ in line, just straight up, because I wanted to see A, its sensitivity, and also B, what you were dealing with, how the speaker itself was reacting. But then after doing that, I listened to it um, with the EQ box in line, and I also tested it with the EQ box in line. And the EQ box itself has numerous settings, so there is a mid bass slider here where you can increase the mid bass or decrease the mid bass and there is a mid treble slider where you can go positive or you can go negative and that just basically allows you it's like tonal sliders there's a button here is it this button yes for bass where you can boost the bass by about 5 db if i recall correctly or leave it more flat but even flat on this eq is not actually flat it still has a boosted bass and a boosted treble. And I'll get to that a little bit later when we go through the actual data. This speaker is really divisive, I would say, in the audiophile community. And the reason, at least as far as I understand it and mixed with some of my, I guess, interpretation of what people are saying out there, the reason for that is there's the audiophile group who believes that this speaker is representative of what you would call an accurate speaker or what you would want for a true reproduction stereo system. And there are many of those same audiophile people who believe that this speaker is the furthest thing from accurate and is not what you would want for a true reproduction stereo speaker. When I tested the speaker, I found that it's not accurate at all, tonally. It's, it's, a, it's a nightmare, the bass is boosted, the treble is just terrible. There's a lot of resonance from the speaker, probably from the enclosure as well. So if you're wanting accuracy, this is not the speaker that you want to buy. However, this speaker does a lot of things that are really neat in terms of soundstage. I mean, it's just the kind of stuff that you want to go grab a bean bag or a big comfy sofa, sit back and listen, you know. Um, the soundstage, the depth that this speaker presents, it's unlike anything I've ever heard. The width, same thing. Of course, that's also dependent upon your positioning near the side walls as well. The reason for that, again, is because it's using what Bose termed as a uh, direct slash reflected sound. And that's all based on the number of speakers that you have that are firing behind, or the number of drive units that you have firing behind the speaker, and then versus the single speaker that you have firing forward. So as you naturally walk around the speaker, you'll get louder SPL as you go around to the back. The ideal placement for the speaker is that you would place it about a foot off the wall from behind it. And then I think the, the manual states, of, I want to say about three feet off the side walls. 
And the reason for that is because they want you to mount it near a wall behind it. So all of the speaker's sound bounces off the wall, scatters and goes everywhere and gives you that really immersive sound. While this speaker does do a lot of really cool illusionary with the, uh, with the sound stage and the imaging size, it does that with every track. And that's kind of how you know that it's not accurate. There are some tracks where I've found, you know, master engineers notes where they say, you know, it's supposed to sound like this. The sound stage is supposed to be, you know, representative of this space or something like that. And let's say that you find a really good recording where the, the engineer or the producers have taken it and they've done a really good job of representing a very wide space that you're supposed to be listening in. Say they, I'm just making stuff off the whole mat. Say they, they recorded in a gym. And you can actually hear the reverberation and all that off the gym. And it sounds like, you know, the drummer is actually placed 10 feet from the guitarist. And, and this person is 10 feet behind something else. I mean, you're able to pick out those things on the soundstage because the recording was done in such a way that allowed you to do that. There's a lot of recordings that just don't have that fidelity. Even though they may have been recorded in the same conditions, they the playback of them, they're not mastered, they're not mixed the same way. And everything sounds smushed. So everything that you hear in a recording or everything that you hear coming out of a speaker is always dependent upon two things. One, how it was recorded, produced, etc. And two, what the speaker is doing to that reproduction. And so in an ideal world, you have a speaker that reproduces exactly what's on that recording. Um, the, the case with the Bose speakers, these 901 S's, or 901's, I should say. Um, the case with the Bose speakers, however, is that even when the soundstage isn't supposed to be large, it's still large, which naturally means that when you do have a track that you're listening to and it has a very large soundstage, it's enormously, enorm, enormously large. There we go. And that's not representative of a true reproduction system, but it's fun as heck. For example, I was listening to Dire Straits' Money for Nothing, a classic that you know I think pretty much everybody knows and loves, and if you don't, you definitely should check that song out. The beginning of the track, as it's, as it's fading in, has a lot of scent that pans left to right, back and forth, side to side, over and over again. Typical stereo systems that I've heard, and I've heard a lot of you know really nice high-end ones as, as I've traveled throughout the country for my work things and stopped into hi-fi stores and whatnot. I've never heard... Any stereo system, no matter the cost, I'm talking 100K plus, set up in very nice conditions, you know, all of that stuff. I've never heard a stereo system convey the depth that these speakers convey with that track. I mean, it sounded like it was 20 feet, like like the panning, the was 20 feet behind the speaker. It was it was freaking awesome, um, but I knew it wasn't right. You know, I just I've heard that song numerous times on, on numerous systems. I've watched it. And Ozone, which is a, an app where I can kind of go through and see how the panning effect is supposed to be to get an idea for the actual soundstage mapping. So I know that it's not supposed to do that. But with these speakers, it does. And I don't even care that it's not supposed to do it. That's how fun these speakers are. They're tonally a wreck. There's nothing good about them tonally, honestly, that I can say. I ran Direct Live in my listening space and it smoothed everything out and got it much better. But when it did, I felt like it kind of compromised the, the sound. Um, I won't say integrity because they're not, you know, they're not hi-fi in, in that regard, but it compromised the sound field, I guess. And I lost some of that sense of spaciousness. Now, I don't know if that's just, you know, psychoacoustic because I EQ'd it, then I felt like something was going to be a drawback. I don't know. But what I do know is that without EQ, the tonal balance of these speakers is, is a nightmare. They're not accurate by any means, but the sound stage that they throw is crazy. I mean, it, it's, it's, so, it's so fun. I can't describe it any other way than fun. It's not accurate, it's fun. So in my opinion, these are the speakers that you hunt down for your garage, for your family room, something like that. If, if you're not wanting hi-fi in the sense of you're not wanting to know exactly what the, uh, the artist intended you to hear, and, and their final cut and their final release of the album or the track or whatever. These are the speakers that you go and buy just to have fun with. You know, I keep saying fun. They're a fun speaker. They're not accurate. They're a fun speaker. So let's get to some of my actual measurements and we'll see how these things perform objectively and then maybe help you make sense of why I heard what I heard and why I feel the way I do about them as far as accuracy goes.
do, 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 do. Okay, so I'm on my website, which is aaronsaudiocorner.com, and I'm clicking my link. And so here's some speaker or speakers. Here's some pictures of the speakers. Here's a uh, couple images from the manual that kind of tells you about how far the spacing should be off the wall, etc. So we're going to keep going. And some more pictures. As far as my objective data goes, I measured this speaker raw, and then I measured it with the EQ in line. And let me kind of back up a little bit. The reason I was really curious about testing these objectively is because with the CEA or the CTA 2034 spinorama measurement system, it's a good predictor of what you will hear with a typical speaker, you know, a front firing speaker. And I've seen that. I mean, I've measured them in that manner. I've listened to speakers. I've been able to easily correlate what I hear with what the, you know, the prediction and the measurements show me. I wanted to see how a speaker like this that is, you know, only like 10% forward firing and 90% rear firing. I want to see what the results would look like on a prediction. And uh, I put a filler out there. I found a, a fellow from audioscienceReview.com, the forum. He was willing to send the Series 5 out to me to test. So a uh, shout out to him and thank you very much for allowing me to, to test your speakers out. And yeah, so here we are. I mean, it's, I don't know, it's more of a... What's the word I want to say here? I guess a research project would probably be more more adequate to describe what I what I'm doing here. So let's switch back to to the data now. So I've said that the EQ box testing that is literally me taking an input to the EQ box, which is this thing, and feeding it a signal and then measuring what comes out of it. So this first graph is the input and the output with base one or base two and you can see there's about a 5 db 7 db or so difference between the two different settings now for the rest of my measurements i left it at base two and then i continued to toggle the sliders so ba mid base mid treble forward and backward you know kind of see what the differences are here the neutral position is the what color is it the yellow line which is in this region and then the other lines you can read up here in the legend later are defining, you know, how much gain or uh, loss there is when you move the slider one way or the other. So impedance, phase, and magnitude. Basically, this speaker's minimum load is 6.2 ohm. It's probably, I don't know, but I'm guessing it's a nominal load of about 8 ohm, which you would think would be adequate for an AVR, a standard receiver, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I think that you're probably going to want an amplifier, a separate amplifier to power these because these really need a good bit of power to get loud. Their sensitivity is really quite low. It's in the low 80s, depending on what the EQ setting that you have is. There's some resonances here, particularly this one around 6 and this one around 900 hertz, as well as this other one around 2.5 kilohertz. And those kind of things seem to show up in the measurements as well. Basically, any blip that you see in an in a impedance sweep is not good. You generally want a smooth contour line. Moving on, the frequency response. This is on-axis response. This is with the speaker in raw form, no EQ. The EQ was literally inside my home when I was measuring this speaker. So, no EQ in this initial graphic. And this shows you basically the raw form of the speaker's response. And you can see that... I've got a plus or minus 3 dB window in the blue, plus or minus 1.5 dB window in the gray. This speaker does not follow that trend at all. Its mean SPL is about 81 dB. This is not a linear speaker by any sort. This graphic shows me playing with the EQ, doing different things, as does this one. So it's just me trying out different settings. Again, go to my website, aaronsaudiocorner.com. Look at the data there. I'm going to skip some of this stuff, and we're going to get down to... Do, 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 do this. So this is what I'm calling a horizontal polar. This is something I came up with to convey to people the frequency response over the entire 360 degree horizontal window. So if you were to take a microphone or your ears and walk around the speaker, then this is kind of what you would hear. So as you go further out from the center is higher in frequency. What this is telling me is because my legend shows front is facing down. So this would be the front of the speaker down here. I'm seeing that there's a whole lot less energy, you know, SPL intensity at, in front of the speaker than there is behind the speaker. So red would be more intensity. And then as you go down to yellow, green, and blue, it's less intensity. That makes sense because there's eight speakers on the rear of this and one speaker on the front. It's just a nice graphical way of seeing how that's laid out. Now, this is a 
normalize. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to go to the vertical polar pattern. Front is over here. The back is over here. Top is up here. Bottom's down here for the legend. Again, same thing we saw before. A, yeah, a speaker that you know has much less intensity out front, especially higher in frequency, than it does in the back. Nothing, nothing unexpected there. I'm gonna skip some of these. These are all with various EQ. So what happens when you you know EQ it? Well, again, you've got more intensity, or I'm oh, sorry, less intensity out front, more intensity in the rear. And skipping, skipping, skipping. This is the CEA 2034 curves. The on axis is the black line. The green line is the listening window. The listening window is plus or minus 30 degrees from the center of the speaker. So here, out to here, and then plus or minus 10 degrees up and down from the center of the speaker. And you can see that the green line should follow the black line if it's a good speaker. However, it doesn't. Again, we understand that that's probably going to be the case because of the speaker's inherent design. One speaker up front or, or one drive unit up front, eight in the back. The interesting thing to me, however, the directivity index curves. For an omnidirectional speaker, you would have a zero line. Omnidirectional being it produces the exact same amount of SPL in every angle. Nothing's different. I mean, if you take a sphere of sound, it's the exact same sound everywhere you go, 360 degrees, up, down, left, right, whatever. For you to have a zero directivity index, that's what it takes. However, we see that the directivity index is kind of all over the place, but it's actually always below zero. A typical speaker will be above zero, will be going positive, and over time it will trend up to maybe five, 10 dB or something like that. This speaker stays roughly the same. I mean, if you were to just draw a line, it would be around negative five. And it's generally behind the speaker, so it's negative five on average. That means that all the sound is being thrown to the back of the speaker and it's all weighted that way. So you hear less up front than you do from what's behind the speaker. And that's really interesting. Now these are all again just me messing around with stuff, trying different settings and then remeasuring and seeing what I got. I actually found, and this is kind of ironic and, and something that is worth bringing up. I tested this speaker with the neutral settings. So the slider is just set to center detent and I measured and what I got let me go over up here is you know a decent on axis response but it actually lifts up as you go higher in frequency if you follow the uh, early reflections curve and the predicted interim response you can see that same thing really with the on axis and the listening window but if you set the treble min and mid bass flat you actually get what I feel is probably a better curve. And as far as predicted interim response, that kind of lines up with a nominal target curve better than setting the detents to the neutral position. However, and this is the kicker, when I listened in the room with this setting, so with the treble set to min and the mid bass set to flat or neutral in the center detent, so basically treble that mid bass there. When I listened like that, the sound was worse than it was with them set both to the center. And I found that interesting. Now, I don't know if that's kind of showing a breakdown of the CEA 2034 prediction uh, because the speaker is so unique in its, in its design, its, its pattern of, of displaying sound. If somebody out there, and I seriously doubt anybody is, but if somebody out there who happened to design or who happened to come up with how we define these curves could maybe provide some insight into why they think that those EQ settings may be better in one way or another in a listening position versus what the prediction is. I'd be curious to know what you think. I'm sure it has something to do with the rear firing speakers, but it's that, that's just really interesting to me. Uh, and moving on, okay, distortion. This speaker has a lot of distortion. I'm not going to get into detail about it. You can see the measurements here, but in my listening position at about 11 and a half feet away, in my main listening room, the distortion was pretty, pretty bad above like 90 dB, so 90 to 95. And um, yeah, it's, it's no bueno, right? And the speaker actually is fine. It's mechanically okay. I've checked it out. Everything looks okay. So I, I think it's just the actual, the old raw drive units. You know, it makes you wonder if they replaced them with newer drive unit technology, if they could 
be made to sound better in that regard, and I'm sure they probably could. Compression is high at certain frequencies. I think, again, this is just a signifier of poor drive units being used. And I'm going to keep going. I used a uh, IEC standard for measuring maximum SPL, and this is a pretty stringent test. I stick with this, however, because I can easily compare against other speakers. And in this test, using a full 20 to 20 kHz tone, or not tone, but stimulus, uh, the max SPL I was able to achieve was about 82 dB. And then if I band passed it from 80 to 20 kHz, it was about 82 dB again. So this speaker is very high in distortion and compression. And that's what causes the, act, uh, uh, the maximum SPL to be limited here. And that's something worth noting. And I also should say, I recently tested the Philharmonic BMR, and I think that, if I recall correctly, it was about 98 dB in SPL before it reached its um, maximum multi-tone distortion limit. And that was with 20 to 20K or either 80 to 20K. But regardless, it was almost 20 dB higher for a, uh, a speaker, a three-way, you know, tall monitor type speaker. And near field step measurements. Let's look at step measurements. So you can see from the initial impulse, this is where the first speaker from the front arrives. And this is where the rear speakers all arrive, their sound arrives. And it's about 1.75 milliseconds or so apart, which actually works out to be about the same distance from front to back. So it, it checks out logically. My subjective evaluation, I listen to this speaker downstairs. I listened to it upstairs. I moved it close to a wall, far from a wall. I did all sorts of stuff. The bottom line in all of my testing, no matter really where I put the speaker, was, again, the tonality was not linear, it's, it's not accurate by a long shot, but the soundstage and imaging stuff that it does is just crazy. It's, it's huge soundstage, it's like nothing I've ever heard. It's enjoyable, it makes you grin. I actually laughed out loud, LOL, a couple times as I was sitting and listening to them. I just shook my head like, you know, what the heck, man? This is crazy stuff. I never got goosebumps. Uh, because I thought, oh, wow, this sounds incredible and it's so accurate. I never got that, but I, I definitely smiled and grinned a lot, kind of shook my head. So it's a fun speaker, like I keep saying. And I did run Dirac Live on this speaker. I found that, you know, using Dirac Live actually helped smooth out the low end, took some stuff, some peaks out the top end. But I believe I said earlier that at the end of the day, it still is not totally the best speaker even with a whole bunch of, of Dirac applied, the soundstage is where this speaker shines. And I think that's what everybody loves about this speaker. And I also think that that's why audiophiles don't like this speaker because that's all it has to show for itself is a very gimmicky soundstage. And I really hate to use gimmicky, but it, that's really what this is. It's a gimmicky soundstage, but it's impressive. And if you like that kind of thing, if that's what you're looking for in your speaker, man, I'm not going to fault you. I just think it's important that people understand that it is not an accurate speaker, but it's it's something else altogether. It's just a fun speaker. And if I had space, if I had enough money, you know, I would have a pair of these in a separate room from a from a reference room and I would just enjoy these for what they are. But I think that's going to do it for me. I appreciate everybody listening. I hope you learned something today. I uh, try to keep these brief from doing a different format. So hopefully you like this format and yeah, uh, subscribe, hit the notification bell, all that good stuff. If you want to help uh, help me out with my website with funding things, you know, I pay $115 to get these shipped to my door. I've got to pay another $115 to get them shipped back. I have a contribute button. Uh, you can donate with PayPal. You can, I mean, a couple bucks goes a long way. You know, if you want to donate five bucks, two bucks, whatever. Um, it certainly is appreciated right now. I've got a few other things on my plate. And yeah, so I guess we'll see what's coming up next. And again, thanks for watching. And uh, yeah. Peace, guys.